Thanks, Matt. So the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. On behalf of all of us, we would like to thank the USDOT for their ongoing support of our rail center. And we're uh, greatly appreciative, not just those of us on campus, but to all the other uh, new rail center institutions. We're, uh, we are all grateful to uh, the USDOT for the support. So now I'd like to introduce the topic and the presenter for today. So for those of us that are involved in rail engineering, uh, design, and uh, maintenance of infrastructure, we understand that there's a great need to take advantage of new technologies for inspecting railroad tracks. So our speaker today will discuss the role of technology in advancing the current state of railroad track inspection. The presentation will review an approach that uses high-frequency autonomous inspection machines to search for defects or exceptions, and this is combined with the uh, human inspector in making decisions. The presentation will address a low-frequency, fully inclusive inspection system known as the single-pass inspection system, which uses currently available technologies uh, for our autonomous track inspection. So this, the presentation will be given by Mr. Gary Carr of the FRA, who I'm pleased to uh, call both a colleague and a friend. Mr. Carr is chief of the track research division of the Office of Research and Development at the Federal Railroad Administration. Mr. Carr has over 30 years of experience in research and engineering to improve transportation safety. Mr. Carr is responsible for research related to track structure and vehicle track interaction. And uh, I can speak from personal experience that Mr. Carr has a lot of different responsibilities at FRA, and actually many of the roles that he has are listed in the email that came out about this announcement if you want to learn more about his uh, research priorities. Mr. Carr completed his BS in mechanical engineering at Northeastern University and his MS also in mechanical engineering at Tufts. He's published multiple technical papers on railroad track structural capacity and high-speed dynamic, dynamic interaction between rail vehicles and the track system. Mr. Carr is active in the development of numerous unique track inspection technologies for which he has received 10 patents. And one other notable uh, element to Mr. Carr is he's a world champion foosball player, too. That wasn't on your official bio, nor was it on my typed remarks. But um, So please join me, in, but it's very important nonetheless. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mr. Gary Carr, who's going to present the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar on Embracing New Technology for Track Inspection. Thank you very much, Riley. Um, well, it's great to be here. I really appreciate that you guys uh, are interested in the subject area that I'm going to be talking about. Um, this is uh, very important to me. Over the years of working on these projects, uh, track inspection has been one of the primary areas where you do, I believe that we can improve and prevent derailments out there. Let's see if we can get this to work. All right. Uh, the main presentation is going to be covering uh, track inspection. We're going to look at things like um, a manual inspection and the relationship between automated inspections and and manual inspection. We're going to try to do this to prevent derailment uh, and, the, uh, and also increase the speed of the process of inspection. And it, this is kind of a new approach. You know, uh, if, if things remain the same uh, as in the past, um, I don't think that we could make many changes uh, right now. But if we start doing these new approaches and start thinking about the new approaches, we may be able to go to the next level for track inspection and for derailment prevention. This is kind of an, e an idea about uh, um, the future rail capacity. We expect over the next 25 years about 100 million more people in the US uh, and about 2.8 billion more tons of freight. So we're going to start moving that. Now, I don't expect for us to be going out there and building many more rail lines. We're going to be putting uh, some passenger trains on some of the, the lines that are out there already. So we start saying we're not increasing the rail lines. We are putting more tonnage out there. Um, the railroads to be able to do this and meet this capacity requirement are going to have to do certain things. They're going to have to increase the axle load. They're going to have to increase the train frequencies, train lengths, and operating speed. Uh, so when you look at that, those, those functions, you, you're basically going to have to, um, uh, you know, you're going to have to do something. Track degradation is expected to increase at some level. Railroads are adapting to this, though. And they're doing that by improving their materials, uh, component designs. And a lot of the, the activities going here at, at the university 
are related to that. You know, and tie condition is one of the, the program areas that we're working on. But it's to, uh, you know, they're trying to improve the technology. But uh, in the long run, there are a few considerations that we need to, to worry about. You start thinking about the process of increasing the capacity of the railroad. Uh, increased tonnage, I mean track usage, decreases the available track time for inspection. So no longer do you have the time to walk out there and inspect this track at a very detailed level. You have heavier trains, uh, so heavier trains on standard components that have been in service for a long time. You look at some of the track components out there, they're not being replaced every year. There is a lot of maintenance going on and many things being replaced, but it's, it's some of the tracks, uh, the tracks that are out there could be 10, 20, 30 years old or older. So it's the same tonnages, these new tonnages going on to the older track is one of the, the concerns or considerations. Uh, higher speed will tighten the allowed geometry. So that means that the, the maintenance limit limits the way the rules are set up right now. If you uh, uh, increase your speed, your geometry characteristics have to be tighter, less al al alignment or profile uh, deviations allowed. And the last thing is longer train lengths may require stronger structure to support the additional inline forces. But let's take a look at the safety trends. Safety trends over the years. This is from 1975 to 2013. And you can see in the, in the 70s, there was a big problem. Many, many derailments. If you look at this chart, at the very um, top part of this chart, the, it's a stacked bar chart, you can see that this top level is the track-related derailments. These, these are the areas of the problems that I've been focused on is the track-related derailments. When you start looking right now in 2013, the two highest causes of derailments are track and human factors. Those are the two, two highest ones. So if we can decrease the number of derailments caused by track and decrease the number of derailments caused by human factors, uh, uh, that would be a, a, good, uh, a good way to go. Let's go um, and look at the last 10 years. The railroad has done a fantastic job. The trend is down. And we believe that bringing this trend down like this, we think this trend could actually go to zero. Well, a lot of people look at this same chart and say, wait a minute, we're at the point of diminishing returns here. You, you, start, uh, uh, you start increasing your inspections. You start changing these things. You're not going to really affect. You're going to cost more money. You're going to take uh, more track time. But you may not be able to affect the actual Many, the amount of derailments that are actually going to be occurring. But, you know, if everything was remaining constant, you know, I might say you might, you might be there. You might be at the point of diminishing returns if everything remains constant. But if you start changing the technology itself, I think you can start changing this graph and actually get it down to zero. And, that, and that's what the talk is today. We're going to be talking about the technologies and changing the total approach to, to the track inspection process. Why do we derail? Now, that's one good question. You, you get out there, we're talking about a derailment. When this train out there operating on the track, everything seemed to fit within the specifications. The track was within spec, but all the requirements are. The train is in spec, but all the requirements are for the train. It goes, operates over there, and then a der train derails. Uh, you go out and look at this, you most likely, because we know the causes in general, it's a, it could be a track-related derailment. Why is that? Well, we assume that after we do an inspection and we go out there, we have really good knowledge about what's going on. But we know our ability to detect is not perfect. You know, we, there are variations in what we're detecting. We don't really know what we're detecting. We don't know what's missing, what we're missing. Uh, we don't identify the critical situations right away. So uh, um, that's another thing. Do we have to start understanding what these critical situations are? When you get down to the bottom, you, you see things like we can con uh, conduct, we conduct inappropriate repairs that don't follow up. That's a human factors related issue in the processes. Uh, and the very last thing, is, which is one of the biggest causes I think is going on now, we've taken care of the single failure mode, you know, gauge widening to a very specific purpose or a wheel climb derailment for a very specific purpose. But now you start getting combinations. You have situations where you have what we call a down and out, where the, the rail goes down and then it rolls out at the same time. And that geometry parameter causes, even though both might be within spec, it could generate forces large enough to cause the rail to roll over. So those are the type of situations that we're looking for now. Much more complicated than the original looking for one type of solution. So out of this, track inspection takes a, a very critical role. Let's talk about how track inspection is done today. Most of the track inspection is, being, is done manually. People go out and walk the tracks. They look at the track, 
they try to determine what's wrong uh, and as they walk the track, and then they determine uh, what needs to be repaired, and they take notes, and, they very, and they're very conscientious about what they're doing. Some of these track inspectors, I've been out with them, are absolutely amazing. They get out, uh, another way they do it is they do it on high railers, which are cars that operate on the rail, or trucks that operate on the rail. They run down this track at speed at 25 miles an hour. I'm sitting next to them, and I'm just seeing a blur. And then you see them come onto the brakes hard, and they get off, and they look, and they say, look what I found here. And they show me something that I had no clue. Well, the way the sun was reflecting off the rail, I saw that they looked like there's an alignment deviation here. So I got out and took a look at it. So they're, they're really very, very talented and very skilled at what they're doing. And, but they, it comes from working that specific rail. But today's environment, people move around a lot more. They're not sitting and working on that same rail over 30 years. They're working that rail for a while, and then they're going to go to another location or shift it to another location. So now there's history problems. They, you know, the, the new inspector has to get up on that specific area. So you know, the, those are the two things. The third one is that people use infrequent inspections of geometry systems. These systems are devices that go out there using inertial measurement systems, measure parameters of the track, like gauge, the distance between the rails, cross level, the angle, one relative to the other, uh, profile on one rail going up or down, uh, alignment going out one rail uh, out or in. So those are the, those, that is going on, and there's quite a few effort, there's a lot of effort going into that, but that's an infrequent inspection. You know, maybe once a month, maybe once every six months. You know, I think the most common is on the Northeast Quarter, and that's like every two weeks guaranteed they're, they're doing an inspection with a, with a uh, uh, geometry car type inspection. Now comes the, some of the, uh, the parts. I really think is this is the direction we're trying to push for, is that we're going to start looking at different technology and man and machine. You start saying, the machine's not going to take over this job. Man needs to be heavily involved in what's going on. But man needs assistance and needs the tools and equipment to be able to go out there and do a good job. You look at the, the experienced inspectors uh, going out there. They can do a very detailed inspection. They can stop at a site and they can tell you everything there is to know about that specific location. They're better at decision making on found defects. So they look at the defect and say, that's a, that's a critical location. I need to have it repaired right away. Or this one's going to be fine. We're not going to have an issue here for another two weeks or four weeks or a month. So we can push it off for a few days. It's not over the safety limits. We can, we can work with it. They're capable of, of um, detecting and searching for a variety. That morning, someone said, hey, we're having problems. We had a lot of water last night. Look out for drainage issues in this area. So he, that day, he's looking for drainage issues. And that's his priority. It's not the, uh, um, you know, he's not looking for gauge. You look at the uh, uh, automated systems, they're very dedicated. They do one thing, and they do that one thing very well. You try to tell them to change and start looking for water when it's really looking for things like cracks and joint bars, it's not going to do it. It's just going to sit there and stare at you and go, huh? So, so you need to be able to, to combine the two things. But you look at the manual inspector going out there trying to look for cracks on joint bars. Think of a crack on a joint bar. It's like a hairline crack. It's the size of uh, your hair. And, and how do you find that out there on the track driving along at 25 miles an hour in your high railer on the inside or outside joint bars? The joint bars are the, the, uh, the bars that actually hold rail segments together. So if you have them on the outside and you're driving on the inside, you have very little chance of seeing that. But they look for other things. They look for things like um, if you have a, uh, a pumping area or motion in the rail at that location, that's usually an indicator of a cracked or broken joint bar. It's much better at, at finding or locating small variations. Looking for that crack, it can do that extremely well. Uh, minimizes the influences of human errors. It works day and night. It just keeps going. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It just runs and it operates. And it can go out for very long periods of time. So this approach that we're talking about is a hybrid inspection approach. Hybrid inspection approach is the idea of the man and the machine working together. Now, this is a study that was done. It's not done on track inspection. This is actually done on microprocessor inspection. There's an inspector sitting there and has to look manually, look at this board and decide which soldering joints aren't right, which parts aren't in the right spot, uh, and make a decision. And that's how the process was being done. They put a, a camera system right next to it, and they started monitoring the differences between what the man and the machine was doing and how well both did. So this is, this is the results of that study. Uh, if you want more details about the study, there's the sources down below. They found that neither the human or the automated system achieved an outstanding performance. 
They found that the automated system was better at locating the defect. They could do the search function much better and find those locations. Yet, um, it could not classify them. It couldn't say, well, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. It couldn't make those types of judgment calls. Um, and the last thing is that the human inspectors, under that specific test, only found about 80% of the defects. So that, you know, even though the human inspector was working hard and, and put a lot of effort into, only found about 80% of the defects. So the goal here is to allocate the search functions to the machines and then, and then have uh, the human, um, and then get the humans to do the better, you know, the, uh, uh, get the humans in there to be working with the machines and then both of them together will do better than one or the other. Okay, what is autonomous track inspection? Autonomous and track inspection is one of the things that the FRA has been working on for a few years now. Um, it's a process of inspecting track from revenue service trains using unintended instrumentation. So this is instrumentation that's mounted on a train. So you might be out there on an Amtrak train running around, and there's a piece of equipment on that train that's running and collecting data that's telling information about the track or telling information about the car itself. And that information is being piped out. The purpose of this is to improve track safety and maintenance practices by enhancing conditional awareness through these automated methods. And again, the important detail, the autonomous inspection technology is designed to enhance rather than replace traditional inspection methods. And I keep repeating that for a reason. Let's tell you how this works. Autonomous inspection. We have onboard units. You can see up here on the slide, on the left-hand side, this is a geometry system. It's the autonomous geometry system. This here is VTI, Vehicle Track Interaction Units. But those are, are things like um, data acquisition systems hooked up to accelerometers that are mounted on the cars somewhere uh, or on the, on the car body or on the truck assembly. And if there's an impact that's occurring out there that's not normal, detects it. It takes that information. You can see at the bottom picture is an accelerometer. It takes that information, sends it over the internet to a database back at home at some location. Um, and that is processed. Some information is, is processed and knowledge is gained. And then it, through a secure service, sends that information out to the maintenance crews or to the inspectors to go out and take care of this. So this is the new method. It's a, the systems are out there taking measurements. And then you come, you uh, get information about your track that it ran last night. It had run maybe every day. When you start talking about these on revenue service trains, if that unit train goes by every single day, it's inspecting that track every single day. So now this is a, a different view. Instead of every 15 days or every month, you're looking at it every day. Now, if you have to react every single day, that's a problem. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. A little more detail about the autonomous system. This is the, probably the most advanced one that we have. Uh, this is it's laser based. It's a device that has uh, gyros and accelerometers. It's mounted up under a rail car. This happens to be under an Amtrak car, 82602. 82, so it's actually under by an Amtrak car that's out there running. Actually, it's taken off right this moment, but it was out there running. Um, and it's got the computer system off to the side. That is the system. It has a GPS on the, on the roof and a cellular, cellular communication on the roof, and that's it. And it's measuring the track geometry uh, at track speed anywhere in the country as it goes along. Simple design, early identification of the anom anomalies, and, uh, and much more efficient inspections at much lower cost to operate these things, uh, the, after you get the systems installed, the operational cost is very low. You don't see them for 90 days. They're out and running, collecting data, pumping that information. The processing and interpreting the data is where the questions come in. OK, how, how does cars work? You actually have a, a remote desktop control room somewhere mounted at the railroad. In our case, uh, we have a contractor site that we, we have this. Where we have, uh, this is a simulation. It's not exactly as fancy as this. It's just a couple monitors and some computers and some screens. But this is what we dream of having. And, uh, and you know, it's like immediate knowledge of the inspection status. You, you, you know where the car is. You're tracking it down. You know where it is within six centimeters. That's what these GPS systems that we have on here. Very, very accurate GPS. So you know where the car is. You know what track it's on. Um, and it, where it went last night and how many miles it covered and what defects it found, it puts those all on a map. It shows you some statistics related to it of, of how many times it found. Did it find it last time? Was it still there last time? Um, you know, some, some of these details. And also connected to the Google Maps and, and things so you can go and locate it exactly where it is on the, on the map and you can go zoom in and use some of the, the features that they have there. 
but you get the library of track inspection data, and when you start thinking about libraries of track inspection data, a lot of data, but think of what you can do with that. If you have to start worrying about repairing this track every inspection, it's not going to happen. But if you can start saying, wait a minute, I've been monitoring this site for the last two weeks, and it's been growing very, very, very slowly. It's not going to change much. So I can actually wait five days to fix this spot. However, this other spot that showed up last night, I didn't see it in the inspection the day before. I'm very concerned about that spot because I've been monitoring it and it's been dropping off and it just went past our threshold limit and we need to deal with it today. So now you can start looking at your degradation rates and from the degradation rates you can make better decisions on when to repair and how to repair. Prioritize your repairs. Now comes the frequency. So one of the things that, uh, you know, the idea of using this type of technology, um, if you take a, a typical inspection car that goes out there and inspects a 14-day inspection cycle, um, and you assume right up front that you have one day to remediate, and you are perfect. You find every defect out there. This is a, uh, a mark of chain program written by Dr. Rome from the University of uh, Massachusetts, uh, Lowell. I think he's retired now, but he's still working with projects like this. And uh, so you see down here in the bottom of this chart, you see an expected number of accidents after three years. Actually, it's just a relative number. You can't really relate it to it, but it's a relative number. But if you go ahead and you make some changes in the parameters, you can start finding out things like, if we do the inspection every seven days and delay the remediation and actually have misses, know that our inspection is not perfect, we know they were wrong, you can get a 20% increase in the, a decrease in the risk of having a derailment. So you just increase your inspection, and you've taken a longer time to, to go out and repair it, but you've done a better job uh, when it comes to decreasing the risk of derailment. You can see the three cases that are down here below. They were just example cases. This report should be out in public very, very soon. Um, but you can see the, uh, um, you can see the uh, delay to remediation, seven, inspe uh, seven, an inspection interval in days, seven days, uh, remediation, three days. We're still perfect at inspecting. It's the 20%. Or you can go down to seven-day inspections, two days of remediations, with still a 13% a probability of missing a fault, uh, and you still get the 20% chance, uh, a benefit of 20%. So increasing the inspection frequencies is key as long as you can control the repair because the cost will go way up if you have to repair immediately every time. Next step of this is the data. First response comes, uh, I'm getting more data. I can't handle the data. There's three things you have. You have data, information, and knowledge. Data is the facts. Information is the process within some context. And the knowledge is the personal map and the understanding what that data actually needs or the information actually needs. So this is kind of the process. Uh, remember, if there's a couple things out of this, don't fear the data. Because I think the data will add and help tremendously. But you do have to automate the processing algorithms for looking at this data. Here's an example. I'm going to show you. Through an example, some results that we got. Uh, data generators, our FRA joint bar inspection system, it's out there running. It runs and collects data. It collects images of track. It finds cracks. If it finds a crack, it highlights it with a little yellow thing down the, below. What it is, it's just a camera system taking an image of the track. It goes into a data collection computer. It's got that accurate GPS system over here and a wheel encoder over there. It goes up through this automated crack detection algorithm, finds the cracks. Uh, it's not perfect. I know that. Uh, in the very early stages of this, we were at about 80%. So out of every 100 cracks that are out there, we found 80 of them. Uh, but that was at the very beginning. The crack al automated crack detection algorithm has been improved over the years. So we expect those numbers to be going up. And we actually have curves for, those, for the numbers uh, that we know. So here's the system. And it goes out and collects all this data. What do you do? You start to get some information from this data. Here's the information. Uh, we went out and surveyed 20,000 miles. 20,000 miles is 5.2 million joint bars. So this system goes out and looks at 5.2 million joint bars, and it finds 17,000 defects out there. Well, these 17,000 defects, are joints, some of them are safety critical, some are not. Some are just, hey, we got a quarter crack here, not something you have to deal with right away, but you still should know that it exists. You go down this list here, center crack, that's where the center of the joint bar is cracked. Um, center breaks, it's where it's actually broken all the way through. You go down this list, you get down to here. This one here is the one that bothers me. 50 double center breaks. But this basically means that out of this, there is no connection to the rail. They're, they're just separated. There's no, they're not connected. And there's 50 of them sitting out there. 
So um, it's these things that cause derailments, uh, major derailments, and nearly right away. Doesn't happen every time, but they can cause derailments. And the thing that's important is that the current inspection process didn't find these. Only the automated system found these. So that is what was important. Manual inspection, inspection. Okay, now you have all this information coming in. We start looking at this data and we say, wait a minute, we can learn from this. So we go out there and we take a handful of sites, actually 151 joint bars. Uh, so there are 151 joint bars monitoring. So I don't remember how many sites it was that took us down to, to that. But it's about 151 joint bars. And we actually look at each location where we have broken bars and we have representative places where there are no broken bars. We go ahead and uh, look at the vertical movement in inches. And this is a plot of vertical movement in inches versus down here the joint bar number. And uh, they're prioritized at three types of defects. Green is this, okay, no issues. There is an A, type A defect. This is not a critical defect, a quarter crack or something like that. Type B is more critical, full center breaks, things like that. These are the issues that you want to have to deal with. You look at this and now you start building your knowledge. Your knowledge of, wait a minute, if I have 0.5 if I have a, a 0.5 uh, ver inches of vertical movement in the track underneath the joint bar, I'm probably going to not have a lot of issues with broken bars in that location. But So that might be my green zone. And choosing that number can be chosen by anybody, any railroad. But if you go from 0.5 to, to 1.5, this might be my yellow zone. All right, almost every single one is broken. You know, If you get into that range, you're going to end up breaking a bar. And the question is, when some of these inspections occur, this is like within uh, four months to six months of each other. So it's actually, uh, it, that's not that long far apart. So you're breaking bars within those time frames. And then you end up, if you get above 1.5 and up, or to two inches, you start having repeat failures that within that month, uh, four month time frame, you're having, you put in a new bar and it broke again. And you put in a new bar and it broke again. So those are your two, those are, uh, uh, repeat failures. So you know that would be my red zone, you know, 1.5 and above. If I have that kind of motion, I'm going to be breaking bars. I need to be doing something to fix that track so I don't have that motion. So here's the knowledge. And we just talked about all of it. Deteriorated joint support is the most prominent condition um, in a for failed joint bars. And people say that to me, you know, that's not obvious. We kind of knew that. We get out there, we find a lot of motion, we have broken bars. Now we have a number. It goes with that. So if you go outside that threshold, you have a number. The number of vertical motion over 0.5 inches, possibly. Another thing that we found, because we took a lot of parameters when we went out and measured those locations, rail end conditions appear to be a contributing factor to the joint bar failure. A high track classes in three or higher, so this is a have impact going on and you're having more breaks occurring at those at the higher speed. So that's another issue. Um, and then the last one was that short cord surface measurements, which is MCO, 10-foot MCOs. If everyone's not familiar with an MCO, it's mid-cord offset. Mid-cord offset is you take a string 10 feet long, you stretch it out, and you go down the track, and you measure the center position relative to the, the two end positions on the track. That's your mid-cord. It's literally a mid-cord. And you measure that offset. And if that offset starts to become an indicator of uh, a short cord surface measurements, 10-foot MCO, as an identifier of the location for having broken joint cords. So those are the things that we've learned. This is the knowledge that we've got out of collecting a lot of data, putting the human being out there to do some inspections and evaluations of the locations, and then end up with a, a, um, a, a, your, your knowledge. This was a Minot derailment up here, and that derailment uh, caused by this double broken bar, um, which is like those 50 that were out there in the other tr out in the track. Another part of this, and this is a point that it's difficult. You go ahead and look at this slide. I don't know how good it looks, but the inspection process is a difficult process. Uh, on these line segments that were inspected, yes, they may have been high-risk locations, and we really appreciate the railroads for supporting us in developing this information. The, um, the, uh, you go out there, 0.9 defects per mile average remained in the track after the standard high rail and manual inspection. So that, I don't know, some of that's because it was uh, uh, they weren't that severe where they could be staying, or some of them were, were very severe. So if you look at this here, there's about maybe 96 pennies there. There's one defect in that, in that list. Now you look at this list, you can say very carefully, you can say, I can find that pretty easy. Your eyes does a very good job. You have all these patterns to look at, and you narrow it down. Now I take these pennies, 
these hundred pennies and I start stretching them on, on the floor and put them every 40 feet away, 39 feet away from each other. And I put two down at each one and I have you start walking down there. And you walk down and if I told you that penny that's stretched out on the floor down there is worth $2,000 if you find me that penny, I think everybody in the room would be able to find that penny. But then if I turn around and say to everybody, all right, you have 10 minutes, find me that penny. That, that's what the inspectors are going through right now. They got to go out and find these things and, they, and it's a difficult job. So the, the, the concept here is, again, on, you take a machine vision system and you say find that penny, it's going to fly through those and it will find them in seconds and it will show you exactly where that penny is. So it just shows, shows you the process. Okay, next part of this is we're going to go uh, into the, uh, into different systems that, uh, that you can find a defect. I was talking in very detail about joint bar. This is the joint bar system right here. What we have here is the list of systems down below and what we have on the top here is a, uh, the number of uh, uh, incidents that have occurred related to that system and the date's not on here but I believe this is 2013. So when you look at the track you say geometry. It's probably it's one of the highest causes, 5,300 incidences. Internal rail defects, in this case here, 390. That's kind of funny because it's strange, a little strange to me, but that's the, the number that we have specifically on there. The uh, switch inspection, vertical stiffness, some new systems. Uh, you go down this whole list and manuals down here. You also see this line. This line is a technology readiness level. So some of these technologies, like new systems, we haven't thought them up yet. So there's no technology there yet. Vertical stiffness, I give it about a half rating. Uh, switch inspection systems, vision-based switch inspection systems or any other type is a very low level of, of technology readiness level. But you can go out there and run some of these systems and start to run this process. So if you go ahead and do that, uh, you end up, uh, now you, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift modes a little bit here. There are, when we talk, all we've talked up to this point, point here has been autonomous systems running at speed under revenue service train. This part that we're talking about now is this one thing we call the one pass man inspection. It's a little bit different. What it does is says that if I'm going to spend the money and time to get out there and inspect that track, I am going to do a thorough, thorough inspection. I am going to look for everything. I'm going to look for the geometry issues. I'm going to look at railway issues. I'm going to look at tie and fastener performance. I'm going to look at uh, cracks or defect joint bars, missing ties, fasteners. I'm going to look and document everything that's going on. So this thing goes out there, runs at 50 miles an hour and starts collecting that kind of information. The drainage and ballast and fouling levels, high wheel impact locations, subgrade issues, track support. It's got those different systems that we were talking about, GPR, those types of things. So um, this type of technology, yeah, you may be running once or twice a year, but you, when you get off that track, you have more knowledge about that track than you did when, when, before you went out there. And that knowledge can be very high. Give you an example. Here's, a, here's the system right now. Um, these are the systems that are mounted and running on the cars on the car right now. Track geometry, GRMS, which is a vertical, is a lateral stiffness, runs down the track, measures the strength of the ties and fastener performance. BTI, vehicle track interaction, grade crossing, mapping systems, rail profiling systems. These are the other systems that still exist that are out there in the industry right now. People use them. They're not mounted on that car, but we are going to probably be mounting those on the car. Vision-based systems. A real defect detection is looking for cracks or internal defects. GPR start to look at the idea of drainage, ballast fouling issues, uh, levels of ballast thickness, uh, vertical stiffness, how strong or how the subgrade is. Uh, and then the last one down here, train control monitoring system. We haven't even thought about that yet. But if PTC is out there, it would be nice that when you're running down there, you, have, you understand you have communication through the PTC systems uh, from the whole system out there. But the whole device is out there and um, measuring all those different parameters. And why this is important is that you start looking at the manned inspection car, I mean this, this one car. These are all the parameters that we have to deal with. Rails and joints are here. Cross ties and gauge. So this is the, the percentage of all the derailments that occurred. I still think it's 2013, unless that sign says something a little different. 80% um, of the mainline accident causes could be detected with that system, with those systems all on board running that one car. So when you go through there, you have a detailed map of your car, of the track, using the one car system. Okay, next part, how do you get, how do you start managing all this data? This has to go outrageous. You start getting all this information, how do you deal with it? I mean, that's one of the hardest things. So the idea is this virtual environment. Can you go out 
and um, take these images out on the track and turn this into kind of a virtual world. We're going to go, hopefully this works. We have a uh, slide here, a little bit of a video, and we'll see if it plays. Okay, we'll try that. Okay, we waited too long. All right, well, we're not going to get there, I don't think. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I really do want to show it to you, though. Unless we can go to the next... Yeah, you want to get to the other video? Can you do it? What this, does, this is, is this is a kind of a virtual environment. What, the, what you do is you go out and take the images of the track, and now that Im those images are all related to a GPS position. Now, all your data we've collected from all those systems all are tracked in GPS also, so everything's tagged together. Is it running there? There we go. So now you've taken all those images and you start walking out there on the track. This is a sample. So you have views from those cameras. They have multiple cameras. You go out and you can look at around the track. Now this is not to do the inspection. This is actually to manage your data. Uh, you might be able to do a limited amount of inspection but you, uh, because you can look down and see if things are going on. But it's really the purpose of this is to manage the data. Uh, you can start working your way through the locations. You just graphically click on your, your map and, and it brings you to the images that are present at those locations. In this case here, they were trying to demonstrate that they could find a location. This is a digger or something like that. This is the part that's important to me. We start taking measurements. This is a car. This is a device that measures temperature of the rail uh, on a moving car at speed. If it collects that data, puts it into the database, now you can go and start relating any images that you have at that location with a parameter that a vehicle would transfer drove by at speed uh, so that we know what the real temperatures are at that location. Real temperature was because it was a good example. It's not the best example, but it's a good example. Actually, the next one is going to be a little bit better. Um, where uh, you end up getting away from the temperature and you go to things like, remember we just talked about the joint bar inspection system? It goes out there, it runs at 80 miles an hour, collects that data, it finds those cracks. It finds those cracks very, very well. Then it marks on it with GPS where it is. So it goes out there and it finds, oh wait, there's a missing bolt. The, this is the bolt from the joint bar system. You go and zoom in, now you can see the image. There's the missing bolt, very high resolution images. So it's the com combination of many different systems all coming together into one graphical interface. So that is the, the theory and the approach of what we're trying to go after. One of my best pictures. <laughs> When we start developing these technologies, we always have this one problem. We need to build a bridge from the developing the technology in the universities and, and get it out to implementation on the railroads. And introdu introducing the technology, there's a lot of roadblocks and a lot of issues that go on. And you can see a lot of these down here. Regulatory issues, that's the one I hear about all the time. We can't do it because the regulation doesn't allow it. Uh, there are methods to go in and, and to, to, if you have the right approaches, you can go and get waivers for the regulation as long as you uh, demonstrate equivalent safety. There are things like you know, positive impact on performance, capital funding, cost benefits. These are the questions you get all the time. Uh, another one is the threat of job loss. Once you start talking about technologies and automated inspections, every inspector out there thinks, I'm losing my job. Well, that's not the case at all. As we talked about earlier, you need them. They just need to have different tools in their, in their toolbox. Uh, but we got to build the bridge that makes it so that this doesn't happen. And this happens very frequently. So th one of the things I'd like to motivate is, uh, is there any uh, ways that we can address some of these issues or processes so that when we are putting money or time into a new technology or approach or process to get it out there and implemented, uh, railroad participation is a major critical thing. And we do appreciate all the support we get from the railroad on any of the research that we do and see if there's a, a, a way to be able to get across this, this valley here. And one of the responses I get when I start talking about technology, I bring the joint bar inspection system out there very, very early in its development. We say, we've got to go out and test this. We've got to run this. And what they come back with, too many false positives. We can't deal with that many false positives. So that's a problem. It is a problem, and I agree. But until you start using it, you're not going to solve that problem. 
you have um, software needs to be improved. Well, that's always the case, right? Uh, it doesn't do everything it needs to do. Uh, look at the joint bar system. It goes out and finds cracks on the outside surface of the bar. It's not finding cracks internal to the bar. It's not finding cracks behind that you can't see. So it's, yeah, well, is it useless? No, it's finding more things than the manual inspection is doing at this moment in time. So again, you have to start saying, perfection's the enemy of the good. You go out there, you start implementing these technologies, and then only through that you can learn about what needs to happen. And this is kind of a story. I mean, the, the, this one here, George Stiegler, Nobel Prize winner in economics. And he says, you know, miss the plane. You never miss the plane. If you never sniff, miss a plane, you're spending too much time at the airport. This is the same thing as perfection, almost the same, but similar to perfection, the enemy of the good, uh, where you're spending mo too much time, you're not taking enough risk. Uh, go out, take some of the risks, and then you start gaining the knowledge necessary to implement the technology we're talking about. You know, I was amazed. And I, and, um, I started working in this industry in the early 80s. In the early 80s, you know, I had a PDP-11 and a VAX and a DEC-10, and I had those green monitors, and we were amazed when we got that monitor, because we went from the deck writer, which is this, like, typing machine, to get this green monitor, and you could actually see what you were doing. It was amazing, you know? And over the years, I started thinking about, what did we do? What did we gain? This is actually in list of priorities according to Nightly Business Report in 2009. Don't forget, five years have gone by since this list was generated. Maybe there's many more that go on this list. And they're in priority. So internet, broadband, laptops, computers, mobile phones, email. You start going down this list and you start thinking of all the changes and how fast that happened. 30 years and it's accelerating, right? So uh, if you sit there and wait for the technology to be perfect, what's going to end up happening? It's going to go right past you, and the next technology is going to be coming on. You're not going to be ready for that one. So you're going to wait on that one, and then you're going to wait on that one. You can't. You've got to just take a, a stab at it, grab it, go out, implement the technology that exists today, and uh, um, implement the technology that exists today. What can we do in the future? Now we start talking about, uh, OK, now you start collecting all this data. You have these graphical interfaces. You start getting things like you know, this, this little toy. I actually think this one is going to be it could help a lot. I don't know how everyone's familiar with this, right? This is Google Glass. You know, everyone has one, right? <laughs> and what it is, it's basically a monitor that hooks to your phone or hooks to the internet and does all these things, and I can see what's going on on the internet. Or I can see things like I've collected all this data on the track, and I decide I'm going to walk the track. So I'm out there physically inspecting. But as I'm inspecting, it's got GPS on it, it's tagging me and telling me, wait a minute, my joint bar inspection car found a defect here. It comes up on the screen here, red. I say, oh, I've got to look at it. Oh, I look at it in detail. I agree. It is a problem. I can take a picture by winking. You don't have I'll voice commands, you know, hands. You know, you pretty much can run this without looking at it. And now you start dealing with um, finding the locations automatically. The inspector's out there. He's walking along. He's engaged in what he's doing. All the information that's available to that track and structure with all those autonomous systems out there running and all that data being collected is now at his fingertips at the moment in time. He knows the degradation rate of that location. He knows the he, he knows um, if it's a defect or or, or if it's degrading. He knows he, there's almost any parameter, and he can monitor it or take a picture of it and write it up and document it even with voice commands. So you know this is just the start. I expect that everyone will have one of these in the next five years. And, uh, and then we'll be going on to the next one. No one's going to have screens on their phones anymore. Those are going away. What's this phone thing? I have this little block that I have in my pocket that I carry around, but everything's going to be run by something like this. And you know, things are just going to change and continue to change just as fast. So um, what I'm hoping for is that uh, we start to adapt and start taking the data and getting this data out there, processing, and then coming up with new approaches to implement. So in the future, what I, you know, I would like to give like goals and missions for people. So talking to students, and, and students is the most energetic group I know. Professors and students are encouraged to continue to develop the new ideas, you know, new ideas, new thoughts. How do you take this to toy that you have now and turn it into the best track inspecting technology out there? Um, and and, and uh, take that and turn it into real knowledge. Uh, for example, we start looking at the statistics 
and, and start telling us information about degradation rates of joint bars or degradation rates of, of foul ballast areas. You know, you can just go down the list. And the railroads, I think, you know, what, one thing I would ask is to temporarily accept some of the limitations of the current technologies. They'll never be perfect. So what you need to do is just invest in what, take your best stab, take your shot at what you need, go out there and invest into those technologies, gain the knowledge necessary, and just try to progress that technology to make it useful for you and get the, and get the job done. And remember, while you're sitting there thinking about it, someone is out there already doing it. So action is a priority. Summary points. Remember, embrace the technology, don't fear the data, and miss a plane every once in a while. Thank you very much. I'm looking for the microphone. You have the microphone, so let's go through questions if there are questions. <laughs> in the area of, in the context of regulatory requirements and overcoming those challenges, I won't call them an obstacle or a roadblock, but a challenge. Um, oftentimes, the technology advancement is, is 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 started by the industry itself. Oftentimes, it's through the FRA R and D. So, in the instances where you, as FRA R and D, are or advancing this technology, let's say inspection, is there something that you can do internally in FRA to get FRA safety on board ahead of the time so that the railroads don't have to seek a waiver, but part of the whole process is to change the regulations. One would have to do on, if you're doing autonomous geometry inspection, uh, how you respond to what you find is going to be different than if you're doing it every month every quarter. And one that just occurred to me when you're showing us the Google Glass, Google Glass is actually a portable electronic device, so you wouldn't, current regulations, you can't walk on the track and, and look at it using that. Very good, Conrad. You're right on top of the game here. <laughs> the, um, I, I do realize, and we, we all know this is what's going on, you know, the idea when you're out there with the, with the uh, um, trying to develop these technologies, this is the battle that we have to go through. We, you know, our job is to make sure that the railroad, is the we're kind of we have one office, not the R&D office, the office of safety side. They're the police department, and their job is to make sure that the, the regulations that exist out there are being followed. And the easiest way, uh, the way to do that is to you have the regulation, you monitor that regulation. Somebody goes outside the current rule, you 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 deal with it. You know, you're speeding on a highway, and you get a ticket, and that's the process. Similar, very similar process. But when it comes to trying to get at new technologies, uh, we have the battle of we're the guys helping develop the radar guns, you know. And and so now I'm going to build a device that's going to go out there and and, uh, um, and police the railroads, and that you know that puts a hindrance out there. So we do work with the FRA Office of Safety all the time. We meet with them continuously. We're constantly talking about these new technologies. And we try to come up with the approaches of how can we implement this technology. And it's not, it's not a simple task, autonomous geometry. Imagine, if you follow the rules, if it finds a defect, something that is outside the regulation, you got to fix it right away. That's the immediate repair requirement. So what are we doing trying to perfect, fix that? We are coming up with a, the science that basically says it's better to not fix it right away and wait three days as long as you and you can decrease your, I mean, improve your safety as long as you follow these processes. So um, I guess the, the thing is that you, you work very hard at this. You try. Uh, we work closely with the Office of Safety. We really want to get these new technologies out there. There are things that are preventing them from happening. I encourage the idea of waivers. Uh, and a waiver is basically where you go out and say, we are going to adjust this rule. Uh, the FRA will adjust this rule as long as we have equivalent safety or better. And, and you have documentation to do that. But you have to have the documentation. You're not going to say, wait a minute, I'm implementing a new technology today, and um, uh, you change the rule, then I'll implement it. That's not going to happen. It has to be working together, trying to solve the problems working as a team. So, all right, did I answer? As for this, I knew that, that it wouldn't follow out there, but uh, 
it's sort of like the radio. Remember the radio in a car back way in the days? Is that the radio? They tried to ban radios in cars because they were distracting, you know. And now the radio is the least distraction you got. <laughs> Everything else is more distracted. So I'm sure this is going to be very similar. And if you were ever warn these things, you start realizing it's just out of your view, and you look up to see it. And so if you focus on what you're doing, it may not be that much of an interference. Next person. Yeah. So, uh, well, congratulations. Really good presentation. Uh, I had two questions. The first one was regarding the data you mentioned. It is feedback uh, instantly to the main office and everything. And I was wondering, what's the procedure once uh, uh, a defect is picked up or something like that? Is it the crew in the car, in the inspection car, or is it in the main office that the decisions are taken? or Oh, what's the procedure with that? Uh, the current process with the autonomous systems, the way they're running, is that you find uh, a defect occurs out there in the track at 7 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night. It puts that information. Within three minutes, you know it. It's flagged. It's here. You know your threshold. You actually get to look at the signal traces. You look at the trace and say, oh, this is a typical signal trace of going through a switch. And the switch has a frog. And the frog, the laser misses that. It's not a defect at all. It's just a anomaly caused by frogs and going through a frog with, a, with the system, they can immediately, uh, they don't erase it. What they do is they cancel it out. It's not a high priority. But if it is becomes a high priority at that moment in time, they and they make the assessment that it's a high priority at that moment in time, an email can immediately go out to the railroad uh, and to the FR inspector at that moment in time that there is an issue out here that needs to pay, someone needs to pay attention to. The railroad would respond or the, uh, the FRA inspector would respond. Thanks. And the second one was regarding the bridges. Uh, it's well known that many of the bridges in the U.S. are coming to the end of their life cycle. And I was wondering what uh, approaches has have been thought uh, re towards inspecting them or uh, considering them, uh, all their structure and possible failures. Uh, uh, that is an open area. I, I am. Our, our, my program area does address bridges and br bridge issues. Uh, the uh, uh, things that we're working on now are the just monitoring of bridges, looking for, for changes in status or changes in deflection. Uh, you know, so in other words, if you're operating a geometry tower over a bridge and you actually measure a global drop in position relative to a previous run over that location, you may know that one of the bents or something or the pile is broken or something is defective, and then you have to respond to that. Um, the bridges, uh, you know, if I get to dream the way I like to dream, you, know, you talk about things robotics. I think uh, robotic bridge climbers would be a cool thing to have. You get out there and you set them loose, and they go up and they inspect the bridge and they take high resolution images uh, of the different joints and everything that it needs to look at, and then comes back down. You come up with a, uh, uh, you know, a, a mapping again and a map of your bridge and to determine where all the locations are uh, so that you, you, it does the searching function and then people are making a decision based on that search. Uh, that'd be a dream and I'm not putting any money into that at the moment. Can you go back to your first slide? Uh-oh. I don't know, can I? If that's a one button thing, if not... Uh, Is it? I don't know, I don't think so. Oops, I hit the wrong one. There we go. It was the one with the derailment graph. The derailment. The trend. There it is. Sorry, it was your seventh slide. Slide seven. I was going to, I, I, I heard your argument about reaching the point of diminishing returns. And I mean, that looks like a that looks like terrific progress, and then you look at the y-axis, and you ask yourself, you know, if the airline industry had gotten themselves down to a thousand plane crashes a year, would they be, you know, patting themselves on the back? And I think the answer is no. So you can look at that either as you've reached the point of diminishing returns, or you can look at it as we've hit a wall, and uh, now we need some game-changing technology to get through that wall and start actually making some improvement. That's an excellent point, and I, I mean, I think it's the same thing. Is that you, that wall, the only way to get through that wall is start changing your technology. And you look at the technology and changing your processes. You know, to get comfortable with the idea that a machine is looking for very specific things. So if the machine is looking for the cracks, 
the human being can be looking for other things and not worrying about the cracks anymore. They know the machine's looking for that, so I can be looking for the ballast, the things that the machines can't see. So you can start changing the priorities of what they're looking for and giving them credit for what they're doing. It's a terrific presentation. Thank you. Hi, Gary. Intriguing. Love where this is going. My question involves the issue of, of risk. Are we, we start looking at inspection, and especially the regulatory aspects of it, the, the frequency is, is rather rigid. You know, safety standards say thou shalt inspect every 30 days, and I'll say whether it needs it or not. And the other aspect of inspection is intensity or the level of detail. You've addressed a lot on the level of detail. I see, I see these things kind of coming together. My question for you is, do you see us, from a regulatory perspective, really looking more at risk to evaluate really when we should be inspecting track and how often based on all this information that we've collected to get away from this rigid frequency type inspections that we have now? And if not, why not? Right. Well, I believe strongly in the idea of using risk to, to judge or set up your inspection priorities. We do have a program running on that right now. Uh, and what it does is it uses a computer model predicting the risk based on yeah, the uh, whole series. Actually, I had a slide in this about that, but I took it out just before because I thought it was too distracting. But the point is, is that it does. It looked at a lot of the different parameters and it gives it five scales of priority. You need to inspect right away down to uh, it can wait for a period of time, green to red, and there are different colors in between. And it uses the things like is it a hazmat route? Is it you know how one was last time it was inspected? What did we find last time? You just got going down the list of priorities, and then you, you put the map of risk up on the screen of the whole United States. And then you start looking at those risks, and you find out like the Northeast Corridor is red all the time because it's got the populations, it's got the materials, it's got everything's going on. But that doesn't account for the frequency of inspections and the efforts that the railroads are going into. So um, somehow that has to be adapted in. Now we know that the uh, the um, the uh, the, the railroad is putting an awful lot of effort into doing the inspections in that area. They have to get credit for that on this risk map. And uh, because we don't know all knowledge, we only know what we're planning on doing. And so, and so that has to be incorporated somehow, and that hasn't been done. But we do believe in that, and we are investigating those areas right now, trying to get risk associated uh, uh, mapping and figure out where, to do, where to, to do the inspection. But you think that'll translate into the safety standards? Um, my goal is to motivate it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> sure. Yeah, just to concur, I think that this was definitely a highly motivating talk. I guess my question for you is, is related to all, all the technology deployments that you've seen, the successful ones and the unsuccessful ones. Uh, what are the characteristics that really uh, took a good idea, developed did the research to support the technology, did the development to support the technology, and got it into implementation? Uh, what did those technology projects do that was different from the ones that fail? Okay, well, the number one thing is the players involved. It's the team that's behind the, the, the doing the contracting work, doing the work for the job. They walk into the program looking at going, this is what I want to do, and it's going to save these things. And we're looking at a program going, well, we want to save those things too. So they walk in the door with an attitude right up front that says, we want to do this. And we're just going to get some funding from the FRA. We may get funding from our own sources. We may do whatever we need to do to get those together. And then they build the critical mass of funding. The, the government can't fund the critical mass on these types of things. So they get the critical mass of funding, and they get the technologists together, the critical mass of technologists together. And combining those two things together ends up having a very, very large success. You look at the joint bar system. We funded for the first five years, four years of that, very small amounts of funds every year. I have a nice plot on that, but I didn't put it in. But what happens is the, uh, it shows that at a certain point in time, the, the supplier started kicking in equivalent funds. I mean, they committed. This is, we're going to do this, and we're going to go out there and do it. So they're matching our funds, or we're matching their funds. And then that goes on for a while, then our funds go away and diminish off and taper off. Well, the supplier now has an operating system that they paid for a significant amount of it. They own the patents on it. I mean, most of the time when you look at these technologies, we'll give the patent to whoever is doing the job as long as they're going to implement that patent. And there's another whole story that talks about that. 
in the, um, and then they go ahead and they start motivating it themselves. They get it out there into the industry. And that is success. And we have many of those. Uh, we also have the other ones where uh, what I call like SBIR chasers or things like that, where people come in and they, I want to do this project because they want some money this week. And they need a paycheck or they need something. They come in, they sit down, they drum the project, they get to the end of the project. We're done. Okay, i got to go find another project to work on. Or I want more money to continue this project here. And that's not what we need. We need somebody who's motivated and directed at going at the, at the full program. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that those are the things that are the biggest benefits. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the discussions. Thanks again. Thanks so much.